Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. My name is Pastor Jan, married to Pastor Mike Gusminski, and we welcome you into our home today. Um, I'm going to open up with a prayer and just one scripture, and then um, I'll go into the whole scripture for the communion message. Um, it's in Psalm 48. That's the psalm today we're on. And I'm just going to open up with Psalm 48, verse 1 through 2. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with all of us this day. We ask you for revelation, not just for the speakers, but for everyone that is watching. Lord, I pray that that um, we become closer to you in this hour, in this day, in this week, in this month, in this year. Lord, I just pray that um, everything that is happening in the earth that's distressing, Lord, would draw us near to you, dear God, in this hour, I pray. Yes. Amen. Well, um, every Sunday I've been giving the communion message, and I, I laughed when I thought about the phrase communion message, because if I was just going to give a communion message, I would just talk about the death of Jesus and his resurrection and and I, and I want us to keep in mind that every Sunday we partake, every Sunday we have communion together because for us, our congregation, we feel that sharing and remembering his death and resurrection is probably the most important thing. So good morning, everybody. And I want to read the whole Psalm 48. Keeping in mind, this is a communion message, and um, how does this apply to the death of Jesus and the resurrection? Psalm 48. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole, uh, whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. For behold, the kings assembled. They passed by it together. They saw it and they so marveled. They were troubled. They hastened away. For fear took hold of them. And pain as of a woman in birth pangs. And when you break the ships, as when you break the ships of tarnish with an east wind. As we have heard, as we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Selah. We have thought, O God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple, according to your name, O Lord. So is your praise to the ends of the earth, and your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Walk around Zion and go around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following. For this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. Well, most of us are familiar with the psalm because we sing it. Great is, is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in his holy mountain. Now, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because God established uh, his city on Mount Zion. And um, why did he do that? You know, why did he do that? And... Um, you know, it's visible. It's where earth touches heaven. It's it's high and lifted up like our Lord. 
you know, in this hour, so there's so much fear going around. There's so much fear. Um, and sometimes we get this overwhelming sense, like I'm just going to pack up and I'm going to head up north. I'm going to find a cabin in the woods and I'm just going to stay there. But see, God doesn't work like that. God doesn't work like that. He wants the opposite. He wants us to, to call to him, call to uh, our church members and become united. He wants to, he wants to remove the fears from us. If you go and live alone in the forest, it's not going to change anything about you. It just, it just stamps on your forehead. You're fearful. Um, you know, in this country, since the dawn of the beginning, um, it has prided itself on its individualism. You know, when it broke away from Great Britain, it did not want a king. It did not want to have one monarch. It instead wanted uh, some sort of government that was balanced. And so that's how we got the three branches of government and we, and we have a president. President cannot do whatever he wants or she wants. They have to go through the three um, branches of government. So the Supreme Court, the, um, the, uh, the presence in the executive branch is the Supreme Court, which is legislative, I mean judicial, and then we have the legislative branch. So it's balanced. If you go to other countries where there is a king or a queen, it works a little differently. But even thinking about the kings and queens in this world, um, they get everything. They get everything. How they live, how they dress, what they eat, where they go. And the people support that. And the people pay out of their money for that. And in our country, it is not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be that we're equal. But the problem is that people got the sense of being an individual is better than being um, collaborative and being together. And so little by little, it's led us to this point where people feel their opinions are worth more than other people's opinions and it causes some, um, some problems in our country right now. We need, the church needs to unite. We need to unite as a force honoring the king, our king, Jesus. Um, now, why was this written? Some th There's like different debates going on. One scholar thinks that this, this was written after um, King Hezekiah had a victory. Um, he was delivered from... Uh, um, Sena Cherub's powerful army, they had circled around and um, Hezekiah and Isaiah uh, prayed to the Lord for deliverance, prayed for help. And God answered, God heard. And during the night, an angel of the Lord um, killed 185,000 soldiers. And then if that wasn't enough proof to Sena Cherub, he went back to Nineveh and he he went in his temple and worshipped the idols and his sons murdered him. I think this is just uh, also a, not a small point, but a point that when you delve in evil, evil gets the last word and you evil may... Sin may come out looking beautiful in the beginning, but it turns ugly by the end. Very ugly. And you know, all of you that know people, and I can use like movie stars as examples, singers um, that seemed so together in the beginning and just drew people to them, by the end, their lives were a heap. And it was really, it was awful. So what God wants us to do is to avoid the sin and go to his holiness. His holiness is beautiful. It's beautiful from the beginning. It is beautiful to the very end. It never turns ugly. Um, so this whole little 
psalm. Um, I just want to summarize it real quickly about what I think our carry way could be. It, it is full of symbolism and really honestly, you could spend a lot of time just going through it. But I think in this psalm, the psalmist wanted us to proclaim God's greatness. He is great. He is the greatest. And again, in this time of our lives, we don't always look to him as being the greatest. We look to other areas and we get fearful. God's city is, is protection for us. Um, when, again, it's in a mountain, it's the highest point of that mountain that reaches heaven. It, um, when we read this psalm, we should feel that we want to proclaim joy to the earth of God's greatness. We want to, we want to, um, proclaim his joy. You know, that doesn't mean my walk with Christ is always going to be easy or with, and even, you know, I will experience pain. That's part of life. But there's something deep about the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Um, after reading this, we need to respond to our Lord in righteousness. See, when you are raised by a king, you learn to follow the king's laws. <laughs> You are a child of the king. There are expectations that may not affect other people that aren't that, that do not belong to the king. If you study um, monarchies, you find out that they have rules and they're instituted. So there's tradition that goes on and on and on forever. They really value tradition. We know, and I was thinking about this, our God is the king, and he does, too, have traditions, and he has rules. But our, our God is different because our God is a king of mercy and grace, and he doesn't live by the law. He lives by grace and mercy, in, instituting the law in our lives. But it's a little bit different. The law doesn't lead him. His love leads him where the kings of the earth are led by the law, not by their love always. Um, you know, we should feel compelled to speak of the goodness of God to all generations. And hopefully then it will be spread from our younger generations to the next generation. So this keeps going. I feel like... Um, this, this, what we're seeing right now, for whatever reason, I feel like there are blinders on a lot of people's eyes is to see the truth. That God is the king. That God holds the keys. That God is the answer to everything. And when we become fearful, when we listen and we hear something bad is going to happen, we need to get on our knees and go before God. We need to, like King Hezekiah and Isaiah, prayed against that army of 185,000 that surrounded that city and God took care of it. We need to trust in our God for deliverance and protection and goodness and joy. And then we will see we need to praise him forever. We need to take that to a level where people are asking us, why are you so calm in this time? You know, it's really interesting, and I can't wait to find out the results of this, but, and I'll let you know, um, my class, they're writing a letter to persuade Santa to give them three wishes. And uh, some of the kids are wishing for things like peace on earth. They're wishing that COVID would go away. This is probably the first time that I have that I have um, heard kids want things that aren't things. And now there are some that are, and that's to be expected, and that's okay. I didn't put any stipulations on the assignment, but 
I, I, I really am curious how many are going to a deeper level. How many of these kids, because what's going on, see that there's more important things they desire. And you know, when I, when, and I was thinking about Jesus, you know, his whole life, when he entered his ministry at age 30, did he know right then and there how he was going to die? He knew he was going to die. He knew that he was the living sacrifice that we would all partake in. Did he know how he was going to die? I'll leave that for the theologians, but my opinion is he did. He did know. And it just didn't stop him from doing what the Father asked him to do. I think in this hour, God is asking all of us if we will do what he asks us to do. And some of you are sitting there going, well, I don't know what he wants me to do. He wants you, first of all, to begin praising him. It's the first line in Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Do you praise God? Do you praise God every day? Do you praise him when you throw something outside and it goes into a crack instead of going to your dog? Do you praise God when you didn't get that job you want? Do you praise God when you hear that there's civil disobedience going on? Do you get on your knees and praise God? That's what it says, the first thing. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. We have to start with praise. We must. And if we can every day praise him, it will change our very being. If God then says to you, I want you to do this or I want you to do that, you will be willing because you have the nature of God within you. Just like Jesus. He knew he was going to die. He knew how he was going to. I believe that. I truly believe that. And he didn't sit there for three and a half years, mope and get depressed and cry. He just went out touching people, healing people, loving people, being their friend when they were alone. Think everything he did, knowing what he was facing, and it never interfered, never stopped him. Are we like that? You know, some of us don't go to church. We stay in our faraway land at home. And I'm not talking about now during COVID. I mean, I'm talking about all the time. Now, there are people that seriously, because of health reasons, they can't get in and out of their house. And we all understand that. But there are other people that choose that cabin in the forest all alone over being together with the church in the house of God. You, you could be alone anywhere. You don't have to get in your car and drive 600 miles. You can be alone right where you're at. And God wants us to break down those walls, to get with each other, whether it's by uh, a team meeting, by whatever, going on the broadcast, going on this and just seeing and hearing the word of God is breaking down those walls. Forget your individualism because when we do that, when we separate and we, we hide in our rooms, we hide in our houses, we hide wherever, we hide behind our mask. We 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 care more about our individualism than we do about God's core cooperate collaborativeness, God's all unityness. That's what God wants from us. He notice when he walked, he walked with disciples. And you know, Pastor and I were talking the other day about the disciples and and you know what they probably said, what they probably did. And Jesus probably didn't once roll his eyes, but he he could have. If I would have been there, I know he would have, he would have wanted to. And we're no different than those disciples. But he was patient and loving because he knew that they held the keys to the future. 
for future generations to know about him. So we need to be patient and loving, but we need to break down those walls and begin to worship him. That needs to be every day, multiple times, multiple times. So let's get our elements now and let's partake being thankful for who he is. You know, in here it says, um, as we have heard, so we have seen. You know, it's past and it's present and it's always going on. It will take place in the future. God never changes. He never changes. It's we who can change. It's we who need to change. So at this time, as we take the elements, we're going to remember for three and a half years. And the 30 years before that, in preparate, knowing that at one day, it's going to be time to move, it's time to go, it's time to pick up. When we think about that, think about our own lives, are we, are we answering God's cry? Are we answering to go into his holy mountain, to go and worship him, and be with him, and pray with him? So, Lord, I thank you, Lord. I thank you that um, you never stop caring about us. I thank you, Lord, that you never give up on us. Whatever we think, Lord, you're there to dismantle the ugly and to build the beautiful. We thank you, God, that you do not abandon us, but you are at our right side. And that you guide us through the daily battles, Lord. And that you give us the power to overcome sin in our lives, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you give us the power to overcome the ugly. All that ugliness that came at you on the cross, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving us the strength and the power. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, the blood, your precious blood, shed for us worthless, undeserving creations. But you bled out for us. So we, we would be able to stand with you, that we'd be able to shout your name. We'd be able to tell people that you are our Savior. You are their salvation. Thank you, God, for dying for us and for raise and being raised from the dead in Jesus name again we thank you amen oh church thank you for being with church Thank you for being a part of Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. And I'm going to turn over to my husband and um, and uh, may his word be blessed and may you be blessed and fight the enemy. Remember, we don't fire, fight against flesh and blood. Even though in this hour it might seem like it, we fight against powers, powers and principalities. So don't give up. Get on your knees and fight the good fight. In Jesus' name, amen. We are looking at the prophetic nature of the church, and I want to go to the conclusion of the book of Romans. I want to go to Romans uh, chapter 16. Verses 25 through 27. This is called the concluding doxology of Paul. It both summarizes the book of Romans, his epistle up to that point, and it uh, is a doxology, a, a declaration of praise to God. Now, that particular, those particular verses, that particular doxology has quite a textual history. Um, most of your translations put it as the final three verses of Romans 16. 
25 through 27. But in various texts that we have of the Greek New Testament, sometimes it's found at the end of chapter 14. So it actually concludes chapter 14. Other texts, it concludes chapter 15. Wherever you have it, it is, as I've said, a summary of Paul's gospel. Uh, Paul states it this way. To him, uh, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been hidden in times eternal, but now manifested through the prophetic scriptures, according to the commandment of the eternal God, for the obedience of the faith of all the nations being revealed or made known, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, or unto all the ages. Amen. Now, this is a summary of Paul's gospel. Uh, it is a summary of the book of Romans. If it's at the end of 14, it's saying 14 is, is basically the end of the epistle to the Romans, and chapter 14 is very important because it talks about unity in the body of Christ. And it talks about unity in the midst of diversity. Paul actually spoke of different beliefs and different practices that different segments of the church held. In this case, it refers to holy days versus seeing all days holy, or eating certain foods versus eating any foods when thanks is given to God. It shows that within the early church, there was a divergence of practices, a divergence of beliefs, and a divergence of values. Most likely, it's showing the difference between Jewish believers and non-Jewish believers. But Romans 14, a very neglected chapter uh, in understanding the central issue of how unity works in the body of Christ. In other words, can the body of Christ hold two different political views and still be in unity? Well, yes, according to Romans 14, yes. And, and the issue in Romans 14 is those of you who hold one view of your holy days and your your, your your dietary requirements are not to judge those who have a different view of holy days or dietary requirements. And those who hold different views from the other group are not to feel themselves in a position of superiority or seek to force their views on others. See, Romans 14 deals with what we would call non-creedal issues, issues that are not part of the creed. I mean, we, we have the Apostles' Creed, we have the Nicene Creed. Those state the non-negotiable issues concerning the body of Christ, things that the body of Christ must hold as opposed to Romans 14, which speaks of diverse views. I have yet to find in the creeds, Democrat versus Republican is of God. I have yet to find in the creeds that we have greater allegiance to a nation than we do to Christ and our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, if Romans 14 is the end of Paul's gospel and the doxology is there, that's significant. Other texts that place it at the end of uh, chapter 15. Chapter 15 then would be Paul's summary of his ministry, and that in itself is fascinating. And then chapter 16 deals with uh, Paul greeting different brothers and sisters in the Roman church uh, whom he knows and with whom he's served, uh, as well as, again, raising another issue about those who cause 
division in the body of Christ, which means in 14, 15, and 16, uh, the final three chapters of Romans, Paul centers in on division in the church. Look what he says in Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, brethren, verse 17, make a note of those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the teaching which you learned, and avoid them. See, there are things we need to avoid right now in this hour, and what we need to avoid are those who cause divisions, particularly through false prophecy, particularly through asserting that what what little narrow spiritual ghetto they live in must be superimposed on all the rest of the body of Christ. Everybody needs to believe what they and their prophets are saying. Scripture actually says, avoid these things. Can I say to some people, you know, you're spending too much time on the internet. Garbage in, garbage out. Get, get off the internet and stick in the word, which is the point of what I, I want to make in the teaching today. For those who do such things, in other words, violate Romans 14, which Paul has talked about in terms of the unity in the body of Christ is more important than non-credal beliefs. There, there are, we already know there are non-negotiables in the church. There are non-negotiables in scripture. There are other things that are greatly negotiable. For those who do such things, those who act in such a manner, as verse 17 says, do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but serve their own belly. They serve their own appetites, their own agenda, their own desires, how they want to see their lives work out. They serve their own belly. And then it says, by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, the point I want to make about Paul's doxology Paul says in that doxology, he says that these that, that his gospel, that the gospel that Jesus proclaimed, that was based on a revelation of a mystery of things that were silent and hidden in Scripture up to the time of Christ. Now, now are manifested in the prophetic scriptures, according to the commandment of the eternal God, for the obedience of faith to all the nations. Scripture is called the prophetic scriptures. We're talking about the prophetic nature of the church. We recognize in this hour, many people are not standing in the counsel of the Lord. They're not hearing the word of the Lord. The things that they're calling prophecy are just simply visions of their own heart, the imaginations of their own heart, based on their own needs, their own agendas, their own desires, based on what they want to feed themselves with, as Romans 16, 17, and 18 says. They're calling it prophecy, and they are bringing division and confusion to the body of Christ. Paul says something incredible here. The scriptures themselves have a prophetic dimension. How about reading scripture to understand prophetically how the Lord is going to establish his kingdom purposes in the earth? Why do I need some um, prophet from the fringes who gets off on how many hits he or she has from his or her hearing God. Why do I need to hear from somebody like that when the Lord from Genesis to Revelation has an eschatological plan mapped out through scripture? We may still need prophets to fill in some of the gaps, to make some applications of scripture in the present time, but but why do we need this plethora of 
just people's opinions right now when the scripture itself is prophetic. Now, there are faith churches, there are love churches, there are hope churches. I mean, our, the body of Christ needs to be a faith, hope, and love church. But let's look at this momentarily. There are faith churches that are really into the manifestation of God's power. Nothing wrong with that, except Power can be abused. And a lot of people walk in this kind of faith mentality. I can name it. I can claim it. I can proclaim it. And it's going to come to pass. See, that's that's saying, that's what the danger in that is that I can create out of my own fantasy a world and I'm going to convince myself that it's true. I'm going to convince others and I'm going to declare it. I'm going to proclaim it. Paul says right here, in Romans 16, in this doxology, that the Lord is going to establish us according to his gospel, the gospel Paul preached. It's in scripture. We have it written in scripture. And that Jesus proclaimed. Jesus' proclamation is what creates the new heavens and the new earth. And that's a true, legitimate, authentic world, not a fantasy world, not an alternate universe not a fringe reality, not a new episode of X-Files, not foolishness. Scripture itself. Now, that is a hope church. That's the aspect of hope. Hope is eschatology. It's the expectation of the hope of glory, the expectation of the hope of the gospel, the expectation of the hope of the new heavens and the new earth that Jesus birthed in his death and resurrection coming to pass according to the scripture. See, scripture is our basis of hope. If the anointing of the Holy Spirit is the basis of our faith and our power, the scripture is the basis of our hope because the Lord has an eschatological program laid out for us in scripture. By eschatology, I've been saying this for a number of weeks, it is the Lord showing us how he is going to establish his kingdom in the earth through the plan of scripture. We also need to recognize the love church and the love church is connected specifically with justice. Justice is the outworking of God's love in the earth. Justice is the outworking of God's shalom in the earth. Jesus didn't come to make Israel the greatest nation on the earth. Jesus didn't come to establish the Roman Empire as the ultimate political system in the earth. He didn't come to make any religion or any political system ultimate in the earth. He came to minister life to people. And he started not with those on top, but those on the bottom. Those on top, he rebuked. Those on the bottom, he blessed. He forgave. He delivered. He healed. Now, he ultimately brings everybody, top, bottom, middle, wherever you're at, to the offer of his kingdom. And he gives everybody access to his blessings. That's justice. See, that's love. That's the practice of the gospel. Hope is the teaching of the gospel, the belief system of the gospel. Faith is the is the system whereby the gospel is legitimized in power and in demonstration of the truth. A, a, a witness that backs up what is being taught. And then love is the demonstration of the gospel through human beings bringing to other human beings access to the complete blessing of the Lord, the shalom of the Lord. Now, that brings us then in turn back to our scriptures in the Psalms. So let's go to Psalm 42. While you're going to Psalm 42, we want to point out to you that we have now begun in the Psalms, book two of the Psalms. Book one of the Psalms was Psalm 1 through 41. Book one is the Genesis book. 
It's dominated by the Psalms of David. 38 of the 41 Psalms are attributed to David. Beginnings in the Old Testament has to do, first of all, with creation in Genesis, God bringing his order out of the chaos. The earth was without form and void. The earth was waste and wild. The great abyss, the great chaotic element represented by the seas and the oceans and their attempt to destroy life, to control life, to overwhelm people by drowning them. The Lord establishes his beginning by saying, light be and light was. God speaks order into existence and breaks the power of chaos. He creates. That's the first aspect of, of creation and new beginnings that we see in Genesis. We also see new beginnings in the book of Exodus where the Lord delivers his people who are enslaved by Egypt. Once again, Egypt represents the chaotic powers that we see in Genesis chapter 1. It's, it's an earthly political power seeking to overturn God's order by enslaving God's people. The Lord overturns that and reestablishes his order. That's a new beginning. The third thing we see, and the reason the Psalms are dominated by David, just as the, the Torah is called the five books of Moses, the Psalms are called the five books of David. The, the, the praises of, of, of the, the, the prophetic singer of Israel. David dominates the Psalms. And the majority of the Psalms in Genesis, uh, in, in Psalms 1 through 41, the Genesis book, are Psalms of lament. Now, book 2 and Psalm 42 opens up with consecutive Psalms by the sons of Korah. Then David again comes onto the scene. Uh, there's still a lot of lament taking place in book 2. Book 2, which runs Psalm 42 through 72. We said that lament runs through the first part of the Psalms. 66 of 150 Psalms are lament Psalms. It says that, that God's kingdom is birthed out of a lot of suffering, out of a lot of pain, out of a lot of sorrow. But as we press through the suffering, as we press through the lament with prayer, God will birth worship. The end of Psalms, per, particularly uh, the final book, the, the, the fifth book of the Psalter, Psalm 107 through the end, 150, it's predominated by hallelujah, by praise, by worship, and by Psalms. And this is showing us how God establishes his kingdom purposes in the earth. That is a, that's eschatology. That's hope. It teaches us that there will be sorrow, there will be suffering, and there'll be a lot of it because these chaotic powers, these powers of darkness are always working against the kingdom of the Lord being established. But God's people, like David, David it represents a righteous king. He represents the man after God's own heart. He re represents the beloved son, the one whom the Lord has promised, I will cause your seed to endure forever. My Messiah, when he comes, will come through you, David, because you represent what it means to go through lament, to be faithful to the Lord and pray and cry out to him, and then... It ultimately emerges in praise because you see that God is faithful and the Lord will always, always intervene on behalf of his people to establish his kingdom in the earth. God has the final say. Now see, that's what is meant, that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 16. Through the prophetic scriptures, the scriptures have this prophetic unfolding about how God establishes his purposes in the earth. He may use a presidential election to establish his purposes in the earth. 
he may be involved with a nation. He's involved with all the nations of the earth. But it is the kingship of God and his kingdom that prevails. And this is where the church needs to find hope. Now, Psalm 42 is the beginning of the Exodus book, but actually, let's go back to Exodus itself. Go to Exodus chapter 1, just to establish a pattern here. We want to see what the book of Exodus is about, so that we can make some applications of this to Psalm 42. In our daily readings, it actually would be for our church that's reading one psalm a day. We began on Monday, book two of the Psalms, Psalm 42, the Exodus book. If you look at the beginning verses in Exodus chapter one, and let's look at them. Let's look at the first seven verses. Exodus 1.1, 1, 1, these are the names of the sons of Israel. Now, the way that... The, the Torah, the first five books of Scripture, the, the, book, the, the Torah of Moses, the books of Moses, the way they're titled in Hebrew are the starting words in the passage of the first verse. So these are the names in Hebrew is Shemoth. And that's the, the Hebrew name of this second book of Scripture is Shemoth. These are the names. And so what that establishes is this. The question is, what constitutes belonging to the people of God? These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his own household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong. So the land was filled with them. Verse 7 states, first of all, verses 1 and 2 and on speak of the names of the sons of Israel. Who are part of God's people is the question that's being asked Shemoth. These are the names. Verse 7 states that fruitfulness is the characteristic of the people of God. God's people, when they are serving him, when they are walking in faith, hope, and love, when they have the scriptures, when they have the power of the Spirit validating their moving forward in the Scripture, and when they're living out justice, they're living in love. Paul says in Galatians, it's not just faith. It's faith working through love. Where there's power without justice, we have a prophetic dilemma. We have a prophetic problem because we said at the start of these teachings that prophets were raised up. The, the office of the prophet gained prominence when Saul was made king. When Israel began to have kings, prophets were raised up because prophets are there to check the abuse of power. So if we're just dealing with power issues in the body of Christ right now and acting like those who have faith and those who have supernatural power somehow uh, are in the place of, of, of approval, well, we're just going to give prophecy after prophecy after prophecy and they don't understand that their prophecies better be consistent with the word of God, their faith better be consistent with hope, and their faith and hope better be consistent with love. Our prophecies and our interpretation of the word and our living out the gospel better have at its foundation love and justice. Well, we've got a, we've got a prophetic dilemma there. Now, of course, in this Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh and Egypt, Pharaoh and Egypt represent political leaders and political power, become a force to hinder the fruitfulness of God's people. It's true here at the start of the Bible. It's true at the end of the Bible. Book of Revelation, who is hindering the fruitfulness of God's people? The beast. Who is beast? Rome. 
So whether it's Egypt in Exodus or it's Rome uh, in the book of Revelation or it's the powers of chaos in Genesis chapter 1, there is there will be power, dark power, always coming against God's people to hinder their fruitfulness. But see, God hears the groaning of his enslaved people. Of course, the Egyptians, a pharaoh uh, is raised up in verse 8, a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. That means he doesn't acknowledge the legitimacy of the Israelites dwelling in Egypt as Joseph's Pharaoh did and succeeding generations of Pharaohs, this Pharaoh decides that the people in Egypt now can become uh, economic assets to the empire, free labor, in order to establish this Pharaoh's purposes. God's people become slaves. But God hears the groaning of his people. He remembers his covenant and he raises up apostolic leaders. In chapter three, he raises up Moses. He raises up Aaron. He will raise up Miriam. He raises them up. Apostle, prophet, and teacher, if you will. Moses, the apostle. Miriam, the prophetess. Aaron, the teacher. He raises up apostolic leaders to set in motion his deliverance. Go to chapter 2 and look at chapter 2 after the sons of Israel come into imprisonment. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, Exodus 2.23, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God hear, heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and I love this verse, and God knew. See, in 225, a powerful word emerges when God's people cry out to him. God knew. God knows. Whatever anyone else may say, Claim, declare, accuse, or lie about us as God's people. God knows the truth. This is a powerful word of encouragement and hope for us. So now when we go over to Psalm 42, we see something very significant, very important. We understand now the Exodus book is going to have to do with this groaning, with this oppression, with this lament, and that is exactly, exactly how Psalm 42 begins. Let me read Psalm 42. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? It's a lament. Psalm 42, book two begins just the same place where Exodus begins. It's a lament. The psalmist, and, and, and in Psalm 42, it describes the groaning of one of God's people as a representative of any or all of us. It moves from the fruitfulness of another day to the oppression that takes place when God is absent. God absent, God's people in slavery. God present, God's people exalted to Mount Zion. And you're going to see that progression from 42 through 48, the psalm that Pastor Jan read to begin today. There's this, there's this issue of water that, that, that manifests itself here in Psalm 42. My soul is thirsting for the living God. I'm thirsting for the river of God. I'm thirsting for the fountain of life. I'm thirsting for the Lord to refresh me with living waters. But instead, the waters I confront are, in verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night while they say continually to me, where is your God? 
the psalmist begins to contemplate previous days when the Lord's presence was powerfully manifested in the midst of his people. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go, how I would go with the throng and lead them uh, in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Those were the days. Those aren't the days now, the psalmist is saying, as the psalmist begins in lament. In fact, the first three psalms, 42, 43, and 44, are all psalms of lament. First two, 42 and 43, are the psalms of an individual lamenting, Psalm 44, the third, is a communal lament, a lament of the entire community. The psalmist cries out for the water of God's presence only to find the water of his or her own tears and the drowning waters of the headwaters and the waters of the sea. We continue, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. See, the prophetic hope that is created by Scripture. This is an eschatological plan. This, this reminder of hope says, God worked this way in Genesis 1. God worked this way in the book of Exodus. God worked this way throughout Israel's history, and God will work in that way Today for the psalmist, today for us in the body of Christ who embrace the words of the psalmist, who identify with the words of the psalmist. Hope in God for I shall again praise him. See, hope is connected to praising God. Now, the psalmist isn't praising God. He's hoping to praise God, but he remembers praise. He remembers the significance of praise. He's not going to yield that area. He's not going to yield to fear. He's not going to yield to discouragement. He's not going to yield to the, the hopelessness of the current circumstances. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Jordan and Hermon are the farthest borders, the farthest outreach of the, the dimensions of Israel. And he's saying, from those who dwell in Zion to those who dwell in the, the farthest out portions of the land. From the land of Jordan and of Hermon. Mount Mazar is, is unknown. No one can figure out what Mount Mazar is. More than likely, and this is, will be legitimized in the context of these next psalms that we read, Mount Mazar is a mythical mountain. It's the mountains of the gods. See, all peoples in the, in the, the, the Middle Eastern area surrounding Israel, from Egypt to Israel to Arabia, all those people, in those areas, Syria, Lebanon, Assyria, Babylon, all those lands believed in a sacred mountain that was the dwelling place of the gods. And of course, based on all those nations' mythologies, their god usually was the most powerful god. Mount Mazar, and there's, there's going to be a, a, a significant shift here, in the psalmist declaring praise unto the Lord, Mount Mazar represents where Yahweh is king, where Yahweh is the ultimate God. And we'll, we'll see that in, in the, these, these psalms here. Deep calls on the deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Instead of the water of the river of life, it's the waterfall from the headwaters of the Jordan. It's drowning in the great sea, the Mediterranean or the Red Sea or the, or the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's drowning. I'm, I'm, I'm thirsting for the river of life. My tears Waters of chaos that seek to drown me. I'm not getting the response of the right waters I'm seeking, the living waters from the Lord. And yet, and here we have it again, 
the steadfast love of the Lord. Chesed, brought into the middle of this, even at the start of book two. Chesed has, has dominated book one, the steadfast love of the Lord. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. Now, I want you to notice something. By day, Yahweh commands his steadfast love. Psalm 42 also starts what is called the Eloistic Psalter. And the Eloistic Psalter, which actually runs for all through book two and even into book three, the name Elohim dominates. Yahweh is not seen very much in, in book two, the name of the Lord Yahweh is not seen very much. It dominated book one. In, in book one, 18 times to one, for every one reference to Elohim, God, Yahweh, the Lord, is mentioned in book one. But we come into book two and there's this, you'll see God is mentioned. In, in the first four Psalms here, 42, 43, 44, and 45, Yahweh is only mentioned once. Now you'll see in 46, 47, 48, Yahweh comes back in, and we need to understand the purpose of the psalmist, of those who put the psalms together and had Yahweh's name dominating book one and Elohim dominating the second book and a little bit beyond that. Yahweh is the name of the Lord for his covenant people. Yahweh is the name whereby the Lord is revealed to Israel. Elohim, God, see Yahweh is Lord, God is Elohim, and El, Elyon, Elohim, Eloah, those are, are just various um, uh, derivatives of, of the same word, Hebrew word for God. God is the name that determines who he is to the nations. See, he's God to all the nations of the earth, but he's only Yahweh to his covenant people. See, that's the difference between special grace and common grace, special revelation and common revelation. That's something the church really needs to understand. He is God of the United States. He's Elohim because he's God of all the earth. He's God of Russia, he's God of Syria, he's God of South Africa, he's God of Australia, he's God of Brazil, he's God of Burma, he's God of China, but he is Lord, he's Yahweh of his church, of his people. And in the Old Testament, he was Yahweh toward Israel, God toward the rest of the nations. That's why in book two in particular, there is going to be this emphasis of the nations, because God removes his people from Egypt for Egypt. He removes, he sets his people free from human domination so that we can go and begin to establish the kingdom of God for all the nations of the earth. So there's going to be this, there's this, this, this emphasis on Elohim, and you're going to see a lot of verses in book two referring to the nations. But it's interesting, the only time Yahweh is mentioned in the first four Psalms of book two is right here. By day, Yahweh commands his steadfast love. See, Yahweh is most closely associated with his steadfast love. That's his grace. That's his redemption. That's his revelation of his person. That's his making us the sons of God and the daughters of God. That's his establishing of the gospel in us. That's his bringing us into union with Christ. That's his redemption. His steadfast love is special grace given to everyone who sees him, knows him, and by faith enters into a relationship with him as Lord and Savior. Common grace is Elohim. He, God still manifests grace to all the nations of the earth. Do you understand that God gives common grace, means he gives people access to his blessing to United States and Russia, to, to, to Democrats and socialists. Do you understand God's common grace is he wants to bless all people regardless of their political persuasions. He wants to bless everyone. Now, of course, he's, he's still going to judge unrighteousness. We, we, that, that goes without saying. What's unrighteous is unrighteous. Unrighteous socialists, unrighteous Democrats. Whatever is, and I don't mean the Democratic Party. 
I mean democracies, unrighteous democracies, unrighteous communist governments, unrighteous whatever governments. That's God's common grace. But his special grace, Yahweh, in the midst of the lament of Psalms 42, 43, and 44, in the midst of lament, ah, where are you, Yahweh? We know you're God to all the nations. Where are you, Yahweh? I'm there by day when I command my steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Now, keep in mind, watch the next verse. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me continually, where is your God? And when God's people suffer, the nations of the earth taunt and say, where is your God? Circumstances taunt and say, where is your God? Voices in your head taunt and say, where is your God? Powers and principalities taunt and say, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. My salvation and my God said for the second time in this psalm. It will be said a third time in the next psalm, Psalm 43. But notice what the psalmist is doing. He is speaking to his soul. He's speaking to himself. Christians, speak to your soul. Speak to yourself and say to yourself, hope in God. Psalm 43 finds the answer from the holy and the living God. Let's look at the answer. Psalm 42 and 43 are probably a single psalm divided into two parts to remind us that there are, there are continual struggles and we continually seek to remember the Lord and press into him. Psalm 43 one starts, judge me, O God, and defend my cause in a, the, in a legal courtroom setting. It's Riv the Riva, or uh, uh, Riva the Riv. Riv is the Hebrew word for a, a suit brought before a judge, seeking, seeking to be healed, seeking to receive justice. And the justice that the psalmist wants continues the lament of the psalmist in Psalm 42. It's, I want the presence of God in my life. That's why I'm coming before the courtroom of heaven. That's why I'm coming before the throne of heaven. We can take the election right now to the Supreme Court, but the court we want to go to right now as the church is the court of heaven. And the court of heaven is we want to say, where are you, Lord? Where is your presence? Where is your steadfast love? Where is your deliverance? Deliver us from our enemies. So church, get in the right courtroom situation, the heavenly courtroom. Defend my cause. Judge me, O oh God. Vindicate me. Defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and unjust man. Deliver me. You know what an ungodly person is? It's a non chesed person. It's the word chesed in there with the, with the word no in front of it. Not in front of it. It says, defend me from the chesed not. Defend me from people who do not embrace your steadfast love as the foundation of all reality, all kingdom truth, the gospel, following Jesus. Chesed, it is God's grace. It is his special grace that he reveals to his people in establishing his kingdom in their midst. Deliver me from these people. They're also deceitful and they're unjust. And what this implies is a, a king that was in allegiance with Israel decided to go rogue. A king in allegiance with Israel who promised faithfulness, who promised loyalty, betrayed that loyalty, was deceitful and unjust. Deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Here's the answer. Send forth your light and your truth. Send forth your truthful light. Send forth the revelation of your truth. 
Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to the hill of your holiness and to your permanent dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to the God of my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre. O oh God, my God, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? And for a third time, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Three times, where are you, Lord? Three times, hope in God. We have an eschatological strategy. Hope is an eschatological strategy. Psalm 44 moves from an individual lament of 42 and 43 to a communal lament. You can kind of sum up Psalm 44 this way. Verse 1 says, O God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. And then it recounts all the great things that the Lord did in Genesis 1 in Exodus 14, with David, the man of God, establishing his kingship, even though Saul was out to get him, even though the Philistines were out to get him, even though his own family was out to get him, even though all the people of Israel were out to get him. But God established it. But then the psalmist turns and, of course, he says, first of all, in verse 4, you are my king, O God. See, that's the key. God is king. God is king. God is king, God is president, God is prime minister, God is Lord. That's what we have to remember when everything else, when disorder is taking place around us, we need to understand God is king, and that means his order will prevail. He goes on and says in verse 9, But you have rejected us, disgraced us, have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe, and those who hate us, have gained our spoil. You've sold your people. Well, verse 11, yeah, you've made us like sheep for the slaughter. Paul quotes that in Romans. And have scattered us among all the nations. There's Elohim and the nations. You've sold your people for nothing, demanding no high price for them. Verse 17, all this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, and we have not been false to your covenant. There's, there's this, this cognitive dissonance between who God is, who the people of God are, and what's taking place in their lives. Basically, to sum up this psalm, it's like, oh God, our king, things today are not what they were in the days of our forefathers. Please do something. And it closes with verse 23 and 20 through 26. Awake, O oh Lord, why are you sleeping? And O oh Lord, there is Adonai. It's not Yahweh. It's Master. We're, we're trying to find Yahweh. We can't find him. We'll call you master. We'll call you God. Awake. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your, there it is again, steadfast love. Yahweh, reveal yourself by your steadfast love. So we have a communal lament. The corporate cry, awake from your sleep, O Lord, reveal your face to your people. Break our oppression as in the days of the book of Exodus and redeem us because of your steadfast love. And finally, we get to Psalm 45. Now, 45, you have three laments here. 42, 43, 44, and all of a sudden now you're going to have six psalms in a row, 45 through 50, where there's a, a complete change, a complete change in the perspective. All of a sudden the sons of Korah, and these are all their psalms, the sons of Korah have a prophetic dimension to them. This is the prophetic understanding that is in the scriptures that Paul spoke of in Romans 16, that shows a prophetic way and a prophetic plan in the midst of this lament, individual and communal, God is going to establish an eschatological strategy. Psalm 45 is a love song. It is about a marriage of the king, God's king, to God's bride. 
Psalm 46 is a psalm of confidence that begins to look at Zion, the place where God delivers his people. Psalm 47 is an enthronement psalm. It's an enthronement psalm that speaks of God being established as king and lord. Psalm 48 is a song of Zion, which uh, Pastor Jan recited earlier today. It's exalting that God is in Zion, and in Zion the Lord will always establish his promises for his people. Psalm 49 is a wisdom psalm. The Lord speaks wisdom to God's people in the midst of this upheaval to look to him, to trust him, to follow his eschatological pattern. And then finally, Psalm 50 is a psalm that calls the community into God's presence to rejoice. So Psalm 45, look at the superscription of Psalm 45. To the choir master, according to the lilies. Uh, some say that it's according to the rose, according to the lilies. Both are speaking of a beautiful flower. Lily, if, if, if Shoshanim in Hebrew is to the lilies, it is actually pointing us to the Song of Songs, which is a love song. If it's the rose, the rose is this beautiful, beautiful, precious flower surrounded by thorns to protect it. Israel being the rose, God's people being the rose, and the thorns that surround the rose are the Lord's protection of his people. It is a maskil. A maskil means a, a psalm that is both worshipful and teaches wisdom at the same time. It's to be sung as praise and worship, but it's to teach God's people wisdom. And then finally, it says, of the sons of Korah, a love song. And it is a song between a king and his bride, a king who is being enthroned, who is marrying his bride. The summary of Psalm 45 is this. It provides the answer to the first three songs of lament. The King Messiah will come as a warrior to deliver his people. He loves righteousness and hates wickedness, and he will be exalted by his God to defeat the enemies of his people. Those are our verses 2 through 8. The superscription, which we just read, says that this psalm is a love song between the Messiah and his bride. Verse 1 says the song itself is being composed by a prophetic poet. Now watch that. Verse 1 says, My heart overflows with a pleasant theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. The poetic prophet emerges in the midst. Now, this is a real voice of prophecy, a real prophet, an accurate voice. See, real prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, bearing witness to Jesus is the true spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19 says, not prophecies that are telling us who's supposed to be the president, who's not supposed to be the president. This is what horrible thing is going to happen. This terrible thing is going to happen. If you don't do it my way, if you don't do it this person's way, Real prophecy in the midst of lament points to the king. And this is the revelation of the king. It's the king being revealed in the midst of all of this turmoil and lament that turns the tide and sets in motion these six prophetic psalms that lift God's people's spirits into hope. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Mighty Messiah King, gird your sword on your thigh, you mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and humility and righteousness. This king will bring truth. He'll bring humility, not arrogance. He'll bring righteousness. God's hand of deliverance. Remember, righteousness is the Lord delivers us. Then he imparts his righteousness, imputes and imparts his righteousness to us. Then we become deliverers ourselves. 
in your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. The nations fall under you. Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. Even Jewish exegetes who attribute this psalm to the Messiah being a messianic psalm say that the Messiah is being called God here. Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom, your, your kingly rule is manifested in a scepter of uprightness, a, a scepter of doing things God's way, the upright way, the moral way, the way that looks like who Jesus is. What would Jesus do? Well, he'd do something uprightly. The scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. See that whole righteous, wicked issue. You've loved doing it God's way. You've hated rebelling against God. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, has made you the Messiah. That's what it, Mashiach is the word for anointed. Has made you the Messiah with the oil of gladness above your companions. The messianic anointing on Jesus brings joy and gladness. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, string instruments make you glad. And then all of a sudden, a female figure is brought into play. This female figure is brought into play in verses 9 through 15. They speak of the king's bride, the church. The superscription says that this psalm is a love song between the Messiah and his bride. Verse 1 says the song itself is being composed by a prophetic poet. He sees the Lord Jesus and the bride of Christ. Revelation 19. Verse 16 declares the bride will leave her father's house, the world, and produce sons. Those are disciples who will be princes. Here's God's answer. He sends the Messiah. The Messiah births a bride, marries a bride. And in birthing the bride and marrying the bride, the bride wedded to Christ produces disciples, produces sons who will be the princes who will establish God's authority in the earth. This is our deliverance and inheritance. The poet prophet concludes the love song with a declaration that this work of the Lord will be declared to generations and nations, just like Psalm number two, which was the first royal messianic psalm that we saw to begin the Psalter. The prophetic poet ends this way. Verse 17, I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. And I have about five minutes to do the last three psalms. Psalm 46 is to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth. Now, Alamoth can mean two things. If it's seen as a single word, Alamoth, it means to the virgins. And see, the virgins are the sons that are produced by the wedding of the Messiah and his bride in chapter 45. Remember in Revelation 14, the 144,000 who follow the Lamb wherever he goes, these are virgins. We don't, we don't have time to do it, but read Revelation 14 in alignment with these Psalms. That's an eschatological strategy that shows how the Lord's kingdom is established in the earth by forming disciples. But Alamoth, if it's separate into the word Al-Moth, it means beyond death. So virgins, one word, beyond death. They're virgins who follow the Lord even beyond death. That's Revelation 14. But there are those who are committed to the Lord, committed to the Lord and understand that he will be with them through their entire lives, even under their deaths, his kingdom purposes will be established. Now that sets in motion this psalm. 
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. David's life is one of trouble. It's suffering and hindrance and resistance to the purposes of God, but we follow the lamb wherever he goes. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives away, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire around, whoops, I'm sorry, <laughs> I skipped the page. Back to verse two, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. The Lord is king over natural occurrences. And there is a reference here to Genesis one again, the chaos in the beginning, these waters of the sea that try to overcome, the waters of the great deep that try to overcome God's order. God's When God's order is being disrupted, we call it times of trouble. When you look throughout the Psalms, when, when David or the psalmist are crying out, deliver us from this time of trouble, deliver us from our troubles, it's chaos seeking to disestablish God's order. So if, if, you, if you think we're in a chaotic time period right now in America, in the world, we are, I agree. This is the waters of chaos seeking to overcome the Lord's order. And the Lord says, no, just like in the beginning in Genesis, I'm going to say, let there be light. Send forth your light and your truth. Let them lead me to your holy hill. Let them lead me to the place of your permanent dwelling. And finally, the water that the psalmist was crying out for in verse uh, uh, in Psalm 42 comes to pass. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Now he's Elyon. He is he's Yahweh and he is Elyon. Elyon is the God who is over all the gods of the earth. Elohim is the God who is over all the nations of the earth. Yahweh is the personal God who is the God over his people. Well, he's Yahweh, he's Elohim, and now he's Elyon. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, which is the holy habitation of the Most High. Where's Mount Mizar? Well, the Canaanites located at one place, the Egyptians located another place, the Babylonians located another place. The Lord says, here's where I'm locating it, in Zion, in the midst of my people. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. See, here's the nations, and it's God, it's Elohim. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts, and now it's Yahweh, Yahweh of armies, Yahweh of hosts. He, Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh Sebaot in Hebrew is the one who rules over all the heavenly hosts, all powers, principalities, gods, angels, demons. There's no need to worry. He has, brings his order to nature. He brings his order in the nations of the earth and he brings his order to the supernatural powers and principalities. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. See, it's Selah, Selah, Selah. Remember Selah, we said they, the Jews say it means forever. But the other thing that happened, Selah was, a, was, a, was um, a notice, a notification in the Psalms to prostrate yourself. We would say forever and we bow in worship to the Lord. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. And here's the important thing, and I, I've quoted this to my church and to people who are struggling with everything that's going on right now. This is how the Lord will establish order out of chaos, his kingdom order. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. The Lord will deal with political chaos in the world. Now, here's a prophecy. The Lord speaks. Be still and know that I'm God. Do you know what that, a good way to translate? Relax. Relax and know that I'm God. In the midst of all this chaos, church, can you relax in hope? Can you relax knowing that the God who triumphed in Genesis, who triumphed in, 
Egypt with his people who triumphed through the history of Israel, who triumphed in the cross by Jesus Christ. Do you understand? He will be exalted among the nations. He will establish his order in the earth. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress forever. Prostrate yourself. 47 is an enthronement psalm to the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Worship. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For Yahweh, the Most High, this is now Yahweh Elyon. Yahweh is the God over Israel. Elyon is the God over all the gods of the earth as Yahweh Elyon. He's the ultimate supreme being, the deity. It's all brought in to answer the lament of 42, 43, 44. We have the bride and the king, Messiah. 46, the psalm of confidence. 47, and enthronement of the Lord. By the way, in Christian yearly readings, Psalm 47 is read on ascension on the day of the ascension of the Lord, when Jesus ascends to heaven, he's established as king. For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, the great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. That's what I think about what's going on right now. What's the Lord going to do? He's going to subdue peoples under us, God's people, nations under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. See, it's about the Lord establishing his inheritance. These are the names. Exodus book. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a, the shofar. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nation. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. We close with Psalm 48. Jan's read it. I just want to point out a couple things. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Now we finally come to a song of Zion, a psalm of the Messiah and his bride a psalm of confidence in the Lord, a psalm of the enthronement of the Lord, and now a song of Zion. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. And I want to, I'm going to stop with that verse there. It does say, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Hebrew word for north is Zaphon. But Zaphon is also a technical term with the Canaanite people. The Canaanite people, the Jebusite people that ruled Jerusalem, that David had to take Jerusalem from to make it the capital city of Israel. Zaphon was the holy mountain where Baal, the great God, where El, the great God, ruled Canaan. So Zaphon was this holy mountain to the Canaanites. This is saying, the Hebrew is saying, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the earth, Mount Z Zion in Zaphon. Zaphon, which is the dwelling place of, of, of Baal, the dwelling place of El, the dwelling place of all these great gods of the Canaanites. No, it's Zion. Zion is Zaphon. The real Zaphon is Zion, where Yahweh dwells and exercise his kingship as Elyon over the entire universe and all the divine beings and all the gods. You see, brethren, this is what eschatological hope is. This is what Paul was referring to 
by the prophetic scriptures, the revelation of the prophetic scriptures and the gospel and the proclamation of Jesus and this praise and honor and glory to the only wise God. All glory and honor to him forever because he and where he dwells as king and lord of the church, as king and lord of the body of Christ, as king and lord of all the nations of the earth. That has replaced these, these, this false mythology of earthly gods and earthly political rules and earthly kingdoms and earthly heroes and earthly presidents and earthly emperors and earthly religions. Mount Zion is Zaphon. Lord, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. Your church has to become truly prophetic, Lord, in this hour. And truly prophetic is to pierce the heavenly places. Send out your light and your truth, your truthful light, your truthful revelation, and let them lead us to your holy hill, the hill of your holiness, the place where you dwell, the place that New Testament calls in Christ, and understand that this place and this place alone is where your kingdom purposes will be established. We pray for our nation. We pray for peace. We pray for resolution of conflict. We pray for truth. We pray for the breaking of the powers of wickedness in our nation. But we pray for the church to rise up in the true spirit of prophecy, bearing witness to Jesus, bearing witness to the gospel that Paul proclaimed. The gospel that Jesus proclaimed. The revelation made known for the obedience of faith for all the nations of the earth. Grant it to us now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace.